All I can think of is I'm gonna date myself. Who remembers Arsenio Hall and the dog pounds? Yeah, I kind of feel like the band should come back up and just bang on it. Uh, but I'm excited. Um, we're gonna have uh, Joe and Maddie on the side if you guys wanna come up. And uh, we're gonna invite them up. Let's give them a round of applause. Come on up, guys. All right, got a nice comfy couch. You guys want a pillow or a blanket or anything? Get real it's comfortable? Not, it's not super cold, it's okay. <laughs> uh, well, I'm gonna go ahead and take a seat here, but uh, we wanna take some time to get to know Joe and Maddie a little bit more so. And uh, they're out there in Zambia in the mission field. And um, I keep thinking about uh, the word mission and um, we're all called to that. Think about where you go each and every day. That's your mission field. It could be in the most obscure place. You could be paying for a repair on your car and God gives you something to share to that individual that's taking your thousands of dollars to fix your car. It could be, I was talking with um, someone the other day who's a math teacher, Nick, I don't know if Nick's here or not, but um, I said, you realize you're imparting into the lives of those students. I said, think about every person that's had a teacher that is their favorite teacher because somehow they imparted into their lives. And so that's what missions is all about is imparting Jesus into someone's lives. And so for Joe and Maddie, they uh, get the privilege of being in Zambia for what, 18 months. Is that what we said yesterday? That's how long you guys are going to be there? Can you imagine that? 18 months out of America. Whew. That'll change your thoughts. So anyways, um, we're excited to have you guys here. And again, the, what we want to do here is we want you as a part of the Well family in the community to really get to know them a little bit more. So that's why we've got them up here. And um, so we're going to kind of have questions go back and forth between the two of you. And if one wants to answer one and you know, you guys go however you feel, but I look at this as you get the opportunity to tell us your story. Who likes a good story? You know, that's a lot of what Jesus is all about, is telling a good story. And uh, so these two, somehow you guys started with a love story, I got to imagine, right? <laughs> if I tell it, it'll go way too long. It'll go way too long. Okay, okay. So let's, let's kind of simplify it. How did you guys meet? How did you get to that point where you're like, this is the one? So we actually met at Chick-fil-A. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's, that's a sign. Yes. So I was working there at the time, and Joe was a customer. And I had been working in the dining room, and I saw him reading his Bible at one of the tables. And the Holy Spirit just put it on my heart, like, you need to go talk with him. So I was like, oh, okay. I'm very introverted, and that's not usually like me. But I felt a nudge, so I just went and was like, hey, what are you reading? And I think you're reading Matthew or something. Yeah, and the conversation just sparked. He said how he had just gotten back from a missions trip from Africa, and I had always wanted to be a missionary in Africa, and he asked if I could talk after my shift, and <laughs> it just kind of went from there. <laughs> Yeah, God had told me to go to Chick-fil-A to do my devos. And I was like, oh, okay. I'll go out of my way and go to Chick-fil-A. And then that was the only shift that Maddie ever worked in the dining room, which actually allowed us to meet. That's very cool. That's very cool. So this is the important question. How long did it take before you said the words, I love you? That would have been... Uh, May of 2020, so after meeting about a year and a half, a year and eight months or so, and then that was right before we got engaged, and then we got married 2020 in December. That's awesome. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. We wanted to be intentional about those words, I love you. We didn't want to use them, you know, flippantly, so we said we're not going to use them until we're engaged, and so that was the first time when Joe... I was the punk that said it right before we got engaged. So I started it. Yeah, you get to that point where uh, it's just going to come out. <laughs> so that's good. Um, so tell us a little bit about, for each of you, how did you come to the point of knowing the Lord and accepting him as your, as your Lord and Savior? How did that come about? 
Well, for me, like I grew up in a Christian home, and but when I was 16, and I, I had been addicted to porn, depression, suicidal thoughts and everything, and just all of that. And But then when I was 16, well, I, have, I have a great friend, his name's Josh. He never gave up on me, uh, just always invited me to this Bible study. And finally, I had no excuse. I was the one that could drive. He did not have a ride and was like, hey, I need a ride. I need you to take me to this Bible study. And I was like, fine, I don't, I don't have an excuse. And took him and just encountered like the love of Christ there. Just all these people my age wanting to be there for Jesus and loving him and wanting to know him more and to be just a community together and just changed my life and then just gave me such a hunger for the word, for prayer, for knowing God. Um, I'll, let, I'll let you go. And then that changed my life. Because <laughs> it's so easy to flow into uh, how I wanted to do missions after that. Um, but I will, I'll stop. <laughs> So for me, I also grew up in a Christian home, and my parents were very intentional about making sure we all knew, we all knew the Lord. And there's not really a time where I can remember where I didn't have a relationship with Jesus. There's not really that, you know, that Saul on the road to um, Damascus moment for me. But yeah, there's been different times for sure where um, the Lord's revealed new things to me and there's been new um, parts of our relationship that I wasn't aware of but yeah for as long as I can remember I've always been walking with him that's amazing how many out here have had that experience where you it goes back as far as you can remember that you knew Jesus that's really cool that's really cool because that's not the case for everybody um, but that's really neat I think about Jennifer my wife very much similar experience and it just sometimes I think about that experience of I've never not known Jesus how cool that is so that is a really cool story I appreciate you sharing that Maddie um, so I know you're itching to get into the missionary side of things and that leads into the next question um, what is again going along the lines of your story what was the story of both of you coming into this mission field and what led up to Zambia and what happened before that that brought you to where you are today? So I also, again, have always had that on my heart. As far back as when I was eight years old, I can remember drawing pictures of how I wanted my house to look like in Africa. I wanted it to be an orphanage and I'd draw pictures of all the kids' rooms. There were all these bunk beds with slides going down from the beds and I think for my birthday, I even asked my grandma to make a cake that looked like the orphanage I wanted to build in Africa. So I've just, I've just always had that on my heart. I always knew that's what I was supposed to do, was to be a missionary. So now you're living that dream. Yeah. That's so cool. Maybe we can fundraise for slides in the bunk bedroom. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> Piper says amen somewhere. <laughs> um, for me... At that Bible study, the leader of that Bible study was a missionary with Overland Missions named Austin. And after about two or three months in the Bible study, he was like, hey, I'm, I'm going and leading trips this summer in Zambia. Would you want to come? I'd love to have you there. And I was like, sure. Yeah, that sounds fun. I, I don't know where Zambia is. Um, when he said, oh, yeah, it's right, right by South Africa. I thought South Africa was like Southern Africa. It's an actual country. South Africa is a country. Did not know that until I got there. And, but I went on that trip, and it just it changed my life. Um, man, just when I like, yeah, just like when you go on a trip like this, you go and you preach the gospel house to house, and it will change your life as much as it changes other people's lives there. Um, and from that trip... I had no idea, We fun things on the side, you get to go to Victoria Falls, all, all these fun things. 
I had no idea we were going to do that. I was just like, yeah, let's go camp out in the middle of the bush and share the gospel for a week. Sounds great. And I was like, this is what I want to do. I want to do this. It was much more voluntary instead of like, I'd, I'd wanted to be a teacher before that. And I was like, this is what I want to do. I want to teach the gospel like this. It's very much like a, oh yeah, after the trip, I was like, this is what I want to do. I think this is what God's called me to do. And here I am. Yeah. That's amazing. So before you went, did you have any hesitation or fear of the unknown? Or were you just like blind faith, man, let's do it? Um, I was in the word a lot. I was praying a lot, hungry for God, and wanted to see him move. And, I mean, you, I think I had started in Matthew. And you read Matthew, and you like, go to like Matthew 10, where, he's, he, where Jesus is walking with his disciples, and he says, hey, guys, by the way, pray that the Lord will send workers into the harvest. And, and you can kind of see like, like Peter maybe at night or whatever with all the other guys, because he's like, Gun ho He's like, all right, guys, you heard the Lord. Like, let's, let's pray for workers to go into the harvest. We've seen all these villages and stuff and people. The kingdom is near. The kingdom is at hand. And they all get together and they pray and stuff. And then maybe a week later, let's say, next chapter, chapter 10, Jesus says, and now I'm sending you out into the villages. And he sends them out. And he commissions them and gives them authority and tells them to go. And... As I was reading through Matthew, I think before that, my heart was very much like, oh, like I wanted to be baptized. I'd read about Jesus' baptism and him being baptized and the great commission of go into all the nations and baptize them in the name of my Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you and behold, I'm with you always. Reading that verse of, all right, now I gotta be baptized. Plug in baptisms June 2, I think. I think. And he was already stirring so much in my heart that I was just like, yeah, let's, let's go. Like, that sounds great. I've been to Missouri for a mission trip or Tennessee. I can't remember. What's Zambia, you know? It's just a flight. <laughs> it's okay. Here I am, send me, wherever. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. That's good. So let's talk a little bit about um, the mission field. We talked the other day a little bit, and uh, Maddie, I think maybe it was you that brought this up a little bit, that there's, or I forget who, but there's like a, different callings to the mission field. And can you tell us what that is from your perspective? Um, especially, I want you to think about, there's some here that probably have never gone on a mission trip. And there's probably a lot of questions. So I think it's important to understand that, yes, you are called to be missionaries. You're going to live there. That's one aspect of probably several different scenarios. So if you could share more on that, that'd be awesome. Um, I think two, of, two examples that I think of that come first to mind is Isaiah and Jeremiah. You have Jeremiah where the Lord says, I knew you before you were born. I have a calling for your life. I should just open my Bible and quote it because otherwise I won't get it all the way. Um, but just the calling of like, like the Apostle Paul before he was a Christian. The Lord speaks to Achaeus can't the guy who opens his eyes or prays for him to open his eyes he's like i have this chosen man saul of tarsus he's my chosen apostle to bring the gospel to the gentiles and you have the lord uh, jeremiah 1 verse 4 or 5 the lord gave me this message i knew you before i formed you in your mother's womb before you were born i set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations and then he says in verse, uh, so verse six, O sovereign Lord, I said, I can't speak for you. I am too young. Verse seven, the Lord replied, don't say I'm too young for you must go wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you. And don't be afraid of the people for I will be with you and will protect you. I, the Lord have spoken. Then the Lord reached out and touched my mouth and said, look, I have put my words in your mouth. Today I appoint you to stand up against nations and kingdoms. Some you must uproot and tear down, destroy and overthrow. Others you must build up and plant. So you have Jeremiah chosen before he was born. The Lord has a message that he's put into Jeremiah's mouth, into his heart, and just... Sorry. And it's, it's just before he was born. But then you have Isaiah. You have Isaiah 6, 8, 
where the throne room of God, you have the Lord saying, who shall we go? Who shall we send to bring forth this message? And you have Isaiah the prophet. He's like, behold, I am of unclean lips. And an angel comes and takes this coal from the throne of God and places it on his lips and cleans him of uncleanliness. And, and the Lord's like, who shall go for us? Who shall I send? And Isaiah says, here I am, here I am, send, send me. And the Lord takes him and then he sends him. And so Maddie's was more of like a Jeremiah, like as she'd grown up, hearing stories as a missionary, she was like, I know I, I need to do this. For me, it was like, oh, here I am. Yeah, I'll, I wanna go. I wanna go, like, I wanna go and make an impact. I don't have a country that's on my mind for missions. Um, and it was just like, yeah, here I am. Like, the whole world needs the gospel. I can start in America, we'll make it to Zambia. And yeah. Maddie was like, Africa. Oh, were you gonna keep talking? No, I should be good. Okay. <laughs> I was just gonna say, yeah, because that's because the reality is, is it's not who is called; it's we all are called. You know, a lot of people I feel like will wait until they have that burning bush experience of, oh, the Lord has picked me; I need to go to this place. But actually, we've all been called. We all have, you know, the great commission put upon our lives to share the gospel with everyone we come into contact with, and. And then you have Joshua coming up after him, spending time in the presence of God. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Then you have Joshua who came, spent time in the presence of God, and then took over for Moses. Moses had the burning bush experience. Joshua spent time in the presence of God and came up into that calling. And same, same with Caleb, too. He's like, hey, the Lord said this. We're going to go take that mountain. Give me that mountain. And then you have Joshua leading the people into the promised land, taking Jericho. I mean, you have, the, you have the disciples as well. Follow me. It's a choice. And we don't, it's gladly, yes, I will follow you. And I mean, you have Matthew. He says, he could have said, no, I don't want to. But he went. Oh, for what you were saying in the beginning, I think it goes back to the other time that we were sharing. We had the same calling. Ours is just dustier, right? We're all called to share the Great Commission, message of reconciliation, chosen priest, priest of a chosen race to go and share the good news with others. But how will they believe unless they hear? How does faith come except through hearing? You must go and you must preach the good news. You must share Jesus with people. It's needed, it's 100% needed. Otherwise, go and preach the good news I, it's black and white I don't know <laughs> it's just that simple <laughs> but what I'm hearing you say is it's a walk of faith and uh, what I was seeing as you were talking each step of the way you took that step and it was like the parting of the Red Sea you just watch God open that door but you don't know what it's gonna look like right you have no idea at times for some I think about it could be a scary move for you, you had so much faith there, but God can call us to that place to, to look at something and go, how can I do that? And he just says, take that step of faith and watch him open the doors wide. You know, if the door stays shut, it stays shut. That's something different. But God so often just opens doors. And what he did in your life, he's just like, yeah, let's go. I don't care. You know, there's something to be said for that and, and how God has really honored that in your life. So let's talk a little bit about... Um, being in the mission field and what that's like. Um, and I'm just kind of curious. I know a lot of people have been on a mission trip, multiple mission trips, but who has never specifically gone on a mission trip where you had to invest some money and all that good stuff? Just by a show of hands, who has never gone on a mission trip? Okay, so there's a, we've got a good handful of folks out there. Um, what, um, how would you begin to explain what that first trip was like for, for you to help these different ones begin to see a little bit more what that's like? Um, I feel like the trip that we went on with, that I went on with Overland was definitely different than a trip that I had been on before. Yeah, I'm sorry, I keep forgetting. Uh, 
<laughs> I'm not red, you're red. Um, <laughs> um, the trip that I had been on before, it was we went somewhere to a camp and helped the background work of the gospel with helping build a church. Our, uh, I think it was a, like a youth camp. We helped with the buildings in the youth camp, the landscaping and all of that to help till the ground for that when the seed was sown, there wasn't rocks in it, there wasn't thorns in it, just to help the background work for the gospel. But then when, you went, when I went to Zambia, the leaders would share the gospel like the first or second day. There would be house to house, there'd be children's ministry, there'd be night meetings. Think if there's a church in the area and you're going on a Sunday, sometimes you'll go to a church and sometimes you'll preach at a church. Um, but they started off sharing the gospel, but slowly throughout the week, they kept pushing you and pushing you and pushing you. And then by the end, the last two days, they're like, you got it, we're gonna stay quiet. Questions, you guys will answer questions. You guys will share the gospel, starting the creation story if you'd like. And it's all you. And so you learn how to share the gospel. Going house to house, you understand more of the gospel because you're actually sharing and you're like, oh, creation story, I didn't know that. Or I didn't know its fullness or all these things. And it impacted me so much because I was like, oh, yeah, I didn't realize that there was this part of the gospel. Or, yeah, I don't know. It impacted me in such a way that I came home on fire telling workers at Chick-fil-A about Africa and recruiting people for expeditions, recruited my wife <laughs> and more, hopefully you guys. So one of the things that I was hearing you say there, and it's interesting because some of us still may have a fear of sharing the gospel, but to go and till that land and give of your, your physical life to labor in a field is still ministry. You're doing that as unto the Lord for someone else. So I think that's really cool for people that may have not gone and there's that fear of, of sharing the gospel. Those are things we have to work through, right? But then to start there, physically working, and I believe that's when God just begins to physically work in us to get us to the point, like you said, by the end of the week, they're like, you guys got it. Go, go door to door. So that's really neat to see how that progresses. Um, was there just working the ground, that ground that had to be worked, or was there actual building of a building where people came with, you know, a trade that they knew that that was their skill set? Because I know sometimes that can take place too. Um, for the trip that I took, we actually did not do any building or anything like that. Okay. We just did house to house. We just did, just did ministry that way. Okay. The building part was for the mission trips that I had taken in the past, where it was before the, before the uh, curtain for sharing the gospel. And so that's why it was so different going on this one, where it was like, oh, like, okay, like other, other times you've planted, other times you watered, but now you're seeing the growth, you're seeing the Lord harvesting, that he's been giving the whole growth. You're watering, you're planting, and you're seeing the fruit, you're seeing the harvest before your eyes. That was super, super impactful. And I think before that, I had been growing in my faith like a line. When I went on that trip, the Lord filled me with the Spirit. We saw people healed of uh, blindness, cripples, uh, deaf. Um, one guy got healed of a hernia. He's like, oh, feel, feel, no. I'm good. I believe you. I trust you. <laughs> I'm glad it's gone. I have faith in you. <laughs> he just filled me with such joy that it was probably only about five minutes of time. Felt like laughing for half an hour. Like that trip from then on, growth in my relationship with Jesus was more of exponential than linear, I guess. So when you got filled with the Holy Spirit at that point, what was that like? Did it take you like by complete surprise? What would happen? Um, so it was after a day of ministry. 
I mean, you see all, all of these miracles happening. People are hungry for the gospel. Uh, and you're like, oh, okay, like, what is this? Like, I guess there's, um, for First Thessalonians 1, uh, verse 5, I think. For when we brought you the good news, it was not only with words, but also with power. For the Holy Spirit gave you full assurance that we said what we said was true. And you know of our concern for you from, when the, from the way that we lived when we were with you. <clears throat> so you received the message with joy from the Holy Spirit in spite of the severe suffering it brought you. In this way, you imitated both us and the Lord. And realizing that when we preach the word, we can preach it with power. And be like, okay, Lord, like, I want to be able to preach your word with power. I want you to, to be moving physically. And, and they presented a lesson because you, on an expedition, you can come from so many different churches, so many different backgrounds. They go through and they present the baptism of the Spirit and they say, all right, here's all the scriptures. Would you like us to pray for you? And then they lay hands sometimes, pray, and you go off by yourself and you seek the Lord just by yourself. And it was in that time that, that then I'm just, the joy just bubbled up. That's, a, that's amazing. So, Amanda, I'm going to throw this one your way because your hand's free now. <laughs> <laughs> so when you look at um, this, this expedition that's coming up for the summer, if someone here were interested in that and they're, they're looking to understand what's that trip going to be like, how would you explain that? Yeah, it's basically just like camping for the Lord. <laughs> you... If you really enjoy camping, you'll really enjoy it. <laughs> um, so you just go out to a nearby village that hasn't heard the gospel before. We haven't ministered to them yet. And you camp there for a whole week. And during that whole week, you go from house to house sharing the gospel with people. And it's just like Joe was sharing. It's not only are you impacting them, you're also impacting yourself as well. It just increases so much more boldness in you. You know, at the beginning, you might be a little bit timid and sharing. You might not know exactly what words to share, but by the end of the week, you're confidently preaching the gospel to people and confidently answering questions, knowing that you know that you know the word of the Lord. And also during that time, there's different children's ministry meetings as well, which Joe and I would come out for. And... There's also night meetings, which we build a big bonfire, and then everyone comes in. We have been telling them all day long about this night meeting, so everyone knows, and we tell them it's at 1,700, and by 1,700, it's really going to start at around 1,900. So it's, it's Zambian time, <laughs> um, and people just get to share testimonies of what happened at that day. During that day, they share... Um, we do worship songs, and I'd say the most miracles and the most um, big things happen at those night meetings. Those are probably my favorite during the whole week. But, yeah, a lot of it's just also making yourself available, you know. There might be somebody who is who has just lost a daughter, and you spend the whole day going to that person's house and just ministering to them and grieving with them. Or somebody else might invite you to have lunch with them. And so you just spend that whole afternoon having lunch with them and getting to share with them your own personal testimony and um, answering any questions that they might have about what it means to have a relationship with Jesus. But yeah, I would highly recommend it. It's, it's an amazing week. You, you will not leave the same. I, I promise you that. So Maddie, tell me this. You're going to be there for 18 months. Mm -hmm. What's a typical day in the life of Maddie? All over the place. Because <laughs> um, we'll have, you know, our weekly meetings that happen every single week, all the different children's ministry meetings. There's eight different ones going on right now. But a lot of it really is just making yourself open and available to people. There's a lot of times where somebody might come to us and say, 
hey, I have a family member that's sick. Can you please drive us to the hospital? And so our days spent driving that person to the hospital and getting to minister to them. Or somebody else comes to us and says, hey, I don't have anything for dinner tonight. Do you want to bring over something and we can share? And say, gladly, we would love to have dinner with you guys. A lot of it's just doing, going about your day-to-day life, just being available to what the Lord wants to do during that day and not limiting yourself to a schedule saying, well, the ministry starts at eight and then it finishes at five and then I have my own time, but just always making yourself available. I think one of my most favorite times of ministry there was where this group of teenage girls just came um, on the day that was what we call our Sabbath on Saturday. And so usually we set that time apart to spend time with our family, but they came and you know, I'm not going to turn them away. They're, they've come and they want to be with us. And they came and they said to me, we have this song on our hearts. The Holy Spirit put a song on our hearts and we want to write it into words. And we want you to do something on the keyboard. We want to write a song with you. And so we just spent that whole day writing a song. And it was just so cool seeing them all um, the whole time. They'd be praying. And then one of them would excitedly get up and say, oh, the Holy Spirit just gave me another word. Hurry, write it down, Maddie. We gotta finish this song by the end of the day. And by the end of the day, the song was finished. But yeah, a lot of it's just that. Kind of instant in season at that moment. Sorry? You were instant in season at that moment. They came, you went, you welcomed them in, and by the end of the day, you'd written a song with them. Yes. That's so cool. <laughs> I really love your guys' heart. I think this is really um, inspiring and builds faith to see how God's moving in your lives. Mm-hmm. Um, one last question that I have is, what's, what's your perspective of what the world is like now having lived in America and, and Zambia? How, how's your worldview changed since mm-hmm. this has all taken place? Mm-hmm. I think for me personally, our time in Zambia really challenged me to know that like it, joy is a choice that you can always choose to be joyful. A lot of times we'll let, when we were in the States, I would let little things, you know, that weren't really big deals, I'd make them into big deals and just choose to be sad and depressed because of that thing that happened. And um, then moving to Zambia, a lot of stuff happens and you don't have control over it ever. And in those different things that happen, you can choose to be, you know, bitter about it, like, oh, Lord, why'd you let that happen? Or you can choose to be joyful and say, no, I'm going to let this trial be an opportunity for great joy, just like what James says. You know, consider it a joy, a pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. And it's in choosing that joy that you actually increase your capacity as well. Because when you face that same exact thing again, you know that you're going to have all the tools that you need to overcome it because you already faced that thing. And in that way, the Lord will just be able to present more and more opportunities for you and you'll be able to use more and more for the ministry. So I think that's the main thing that shifted my worldview of, you know, there's, there's always gonna be things, there's always gonna be things that, you know, the world will throw at you and you can choose to, look at those things and be bitter about it, or you can choose to have joy and peace. That's really good. I really appreciate you sharing that. We do. We get a choice every day, and uh, what we do with it is all up to us. So that, that's really amazing to hear that. Um, so, Joe, I know there was a couple things that God really put on your heart. We've got a few minutes left. Um, so why don't you share a little bit from your heart, and then um, once we get done, we'll wrap up with some prayer and really appreciate hearing what God has on your heart. Um, I think one thing as we've been up here talking that has helped my life a lot was truth versus experience of you can either match your experience to the truth or you can truth to experience of I haven't experienced this certain thing so therefore it's not true of like the word of believing that it's God's will for health, for healing. Matching your experience up to that 
Or you can say, my experience says that I prayed for someone, saw nothing, so therefore God either doesn't or he only sometimes. Things, things like that, as we were talking. It's just the truth and experiencing has been so real to me. Yeah, I don't know. But, but what was on my heart before this was unity in the church through, throughout different churches. And I've been able to meet different people from different churches who have a heart for unity in the body of Christ. Of We, we live in Zealand. There's churches on many different corners, some right next to each other. And you don't hear much about what each other church is doing mainly only the church that you're going to, of just encouraging us to reach out to our brothers and sisters who are in other churches to bind ourselves together, to take this great commission and expand the kingdom of God, not just the kingdom of, of the well or the kingdom of another church, of taking the great commission and seeing our brothers and sisters not as a different denomination or a different church, but to go at it together. We see that disunity in Chipepo, where we live, and that's been something that's been, been being confronted for eight years that we've been seeing fruit in recently, in the last few years, in the last two years maybe. And it's breaking through the different walls that the devil's put up and just expanding the kingdom of God with that unity that was in the first church is powerful. And I'm so excited to see that in, in West Michigan and how we'll take Grand Rapids that way. So cool. Amen. I appreciate you sharing your heart. That is so good. Um, I'll tell you what, why don't you go ahead and, and pray for the Well family and uh, just bless us. And we just so thank you guys for coming up here and sharing your hearts and we're excited to hear the stories as you go to Zambia and have opportunity to come back know that we as a well will be lifting you up in prayer and supporting you in any way that we can but if you can just pray for the, the community here that would be great thank you Lord so much for your church and for the beautiful way that you've designed it, for the ability to come together and worship you, to grow together in unity and to be bonded together through family. I just thank you so much for the blessing that is the church. I thank you, Lord, for this body of Christ. Thank you, Lord, for the unity that is here. Lord, we ask that you would just strengthen and grow that unity even more over the next few years, Lord, that this church would just be so intertwined together. I see people going and grieving together. I see people going and just breaking bread together in each other's homes. Lord, I ask that there just be an increase of that in these next few years, Lord. Just ask also for a stirring of the mission in everyone's heart here that they would that everyone would remember that we're all called, that we all have the great commission put upon our lives, that we all have the responsibility to go and to share, that we have this great message of salvation and restoration that's on our hearts. Every single one of us does, even if you don't think that you do, you do. And hmm, I feel like the Lord is saying there's maybe one person or some people here that they feel they feel like they're too timid. They feel like they don't have a message to share or that their message is too, it's too little. It's not as big and strong as somebody else that's sitting next to them. And the Lord has given you a message that you are supposed to share. To keep it to yourself would do a great disservice to the person that you're supposed to share it to. So don't let the enemy try to belittle your testimony, to belittle your voice, because he has empowered you with a great, big, booming voice that's supposed to go and to share. Mm. 
Lord, let us walk away from here with a deep passion burning inside of us to go and to share wherever we may go, whether we go out to lunch with friends and family or back home, that you would just give us that desire to go and to share, whether it be with our waitress or with a neighbor or somebody who's walking down the street, Lord, that we would feel enticed to go and to speak with them. Thank you, Jesus, for the end picture. Thank you, Lord, for Revelation 7, for the crowd clothed in white of every nation, every tribe, and every tongue singing praises to you. You are worthy, Lord. We love you, Jesus. You are amazing. Ah, oh, you are such a great God. We have tasted and we have seen that you are good. Thank you, Lord, for letting us enter your courts with thanksgiving and with praise. God, we just praise you. You are so good. Lord, we ask that you would stir our hearts to share you, that our message brings comfort and salvation to others, that we are ministers of reconciliation, that we are ambassadors, that we are sent. Thank you, Lord, for the authority that you've given. Thank you, Jesus. You are awesome. We love you, Jesus, and you love us. Thank you, Jesus, in your name, amen.